For a moment, imagine that you had to invent a story about people who lived in Germany 100 years ago. In order for the story to appear genuine, you'd have to give people the right sort of name that fit the time and place in which they lived. So off the top of your head, you might know Hans, Franz, Adolf, and Gunther are older German names, but you'd probably peter out after a little while. And in order for your story to appear real, you would not only have to get the right names, but you would need to get them in the right proportion and frequency, all without the help of Google. This would be a tough test for your own home state, let alone some faraway land. So why do I bring this up? Well, Skeptics often say that the gospel writers were writing far away long after the events they record, but one way we know the gospel writers were familiar with the setting they're writing about comes in the form of their awareness of personal names. In his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, New Testament scholar Richard Bauckham has created charts of the relative frequency of various personal names in Palestine around the time of Jesus. For some quick background, Bauckham looked at sources including Josephus, the Dead Sea Scrolls, early rabbinic texts, and ossuaries or bone boxes from around 330 BC to 200 AD, and most most of his data came from 50 BC to 135 AD. When you compare the findings of Bauckham to the names that we find in the Gospels and Acts, we find a pretty good correlation, especially among the men. So in the Palestinian literature, 15.6 of the men were named Simon or Joseph. In the Gospels and Acts, it's 18.2. 41.5% of the men had one of the most nine popular names, while in the Gospels and Acts, it's 40.3%. And while it's not quite as close with women, the rates are still pretty well correlated. In the ancient literature, 28.6% of the women had the name Mary or Salome, 38.9% in the Gospels. 49.7% of the women had nine of the most popular names. 61.1% is the rate found in the Gospels. Now you might be thinking, okay, so what's the big deal? Couldn't Jews in some foreign country invent some Jewish names that fit the context of first century Palestine? But we can actually run a comparison and see that it wouldn't be at all an easy thing to do. So in Alexandria, Egypt, there was a very high population of Jews, and the most popular names were Eleazar, Sabbatius, Joseph, Dosithius, Pappus, and Ptolemaeus. Outside of Eleazar and Joseph, these other names were not at all popular in Palestine. In Palestine, the most popular names are Simon, Joseph, Eleazar, Judah, Johannan, or John, and Joshua, or Jesus. New Testament scholar Peter J. Williams says that this pattern holds whether we look at Jews in North Africa, Asia Minor, or or Rome around the time of Jesus. So if someone were living in another part of the Roman Empire, they wouldn't be able to think of a plausible group of names for Palestinian Jews at this kind of rate unless they got extremely lucky. Remember, no reference works existed for fiction writers to consult to create such a quality of historicity. But we can even take this argument a step further. If you grew up with a more common name like James, John, or Michael, you probably had classmates with the same name. This could quickly get confusing, so you probably had to go by your last name or or some kind of nickname. So for example, at my old job, there were already several Eric's there, so I went by my last name, Manning, or people just called me Grumpy Cat. Mind you that this wasn't because I was some sort of major sourpuss. I just had a Grumpy Cat coffee mug, and for some reason, my coworkers thought that was just absolutely hilarious. Anyway, at the time of Jesus, the common ways of removing ambiguity are including a person's father's name, their job, or where they're from. And so for instance, we know that Simon was the most popular Palestinian Jew name, and Jesus had two disciples named Simon. So we see that there was Simon Peter, a nickname given by Jesus. There was also Simon the Zealot. Jesus was also friends with Simon the Leper. And there was Simon of Cyrene who helped carry his cross. This pattern of disambiguation is seen in the other names of the 12 apostles. Here's the roster. Just take a look. James and John were common names, and so they went by the sons of Zebedee and were also nicknamed the sons of Thunder. There's also James the son of Alphaeus. Matthew was the ninth most common name, so he went by Matthew the tax collector. And there were two Judas. One was Judas Iscariot, which means Man of Kerioth, which is a town located south of Jerusalem. And we'll talk about the other Judas in just a second, so hold on to that thought. Philip, Andrew, Bartholomew, and Thomas were not common names, and so they needed no disambiguation. All of these names are not only genuinely Palestinian, but these disambiguation patterns would only work in Palestine and nowhere else. Some Jews also had Latin or Greek names. So for example, Colossians refers to a disciple named Jesus, who also had a Latinized name name, Justice. As I've mentioned, the name Jesus was one of the more common Palestinian names, so the extra name was needed to distinguish him from the obviously more famous Jesus. The other Judas was part of the Twelve, and he went by his more Greek name, Thaddeus. And I can't say that I blame him, especially after the crucifixion. I mean, how many people in our westernized society name their kid Judas even to this day? It's also why we don't see many German babies named Adolf over the past 70 or 80 so years. This is also 
Also, when the gospel writers record people speaking about Jesus, it's often with some kind of disambiguator. So when the narrator refers to Jesus, it's often simply just Jesus. Let's look at the Gospel of Mark to illustrate this. Narrating in the first chapter, Mark 1.9 says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth. Mark 1.14, just a few verses later, says, Jesus came into Galilee. Mark 1.17, And Jesus said to them, Follow me. But when Jesus encounters demons in the synagogue, they cry out, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? And when the crowd tells blind Bartimaeus that Jesus of Nazareth was walking by, it prompted him to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the servant girl says to Peter, you are with the Nazarene Jesus. And you can actually research this in the other Gospels as well. It's a pattern that is in all four of them. New Testament scholar Peter J. Williams also points out in his book, Can We Trust the Gospels, that we don't see this kind of information in the apocryphal Gospels that were written later and further away from Judea. The Gospel of Thomas names Thomas, obviously, and James the just Matthew, who would have been a well-known gospel writer by that time, and of course, the most popular disciple of all, Simon Peter. The Gospel of Mary names Levi, Andrew, and Peter, and the Gospel of Judas names Jesus and Judas, and a bunch of really weird names like Barbalo or Nebro that aren't Palestinian at all. So when you look at this comparison, it seems to me that the simplest explanation is that the gospel writers were giving us an authentic pattern of names in their stories because they were reliably reporting what people were truly called. Now, think about the nature of names for just a second. If we're being honest, names don't tell you anything about a person that you're meeting, so they don't really give your brain anything to really cling to. I'm sure that we've all been to parties and spent 30 minutes talking to total strangers. Chances are we remember their face, what they do for a living, their hobbies and interests, and whatever else might have been said during the course of the conversation, but we typically forget their name five seconds after they introduce themselves. People are just horrible with names. New Testament scholar Peter J. Williams remarks that, given that names are also hard to remember, the authentic pattern of names in the Gospels suggests that their testimony is of high quality. After all, if they remembered the less memorable details, the names of individuals, then they should have no difficulty remembering the more memorable outline of events. So, names in the Gospels turn out to be a very sneaky good, under-the-radar type of argument for the historical reliability of the Gospels. No, they don't prove that Jesus worked miracles or rose from the dead, but if the four evangelists can get little details like names right, it should make us consider that they were probably accurate accurate and other matters that we can't check. And importantly, it takes away the whole idea that the gospel writers were writing much later, far, far away from the alleged events that they report.